Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's public meeting of its Consumer Advisory Board at the State House Convention Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is an independent federal agency whose mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. My name is Zixta Martinez. I'm the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the CFPB, and we are very happy to be in Little Rock, Arkansas. This is the CAB's second public meeting of the year, and as always, we have a packed schedule. Today's meeting is being recorded and will be available at consumerfinance.gov. You can also follow CFPB on Facebook and Twitter. Let me spend just a few minutes telling you about what you can expect at today's public meeting. First, I'll introduce the Bureau's CAB members. Then the CFPB's director, Richard Cordray, will provide opening remarks. Following the director's remarks, Jean Koo, the Bureau's assistant director for the Office of Consumer Engagement, and Irene Sirikki, the Bureau's Senior Financial Education Program Analyst for the Office of Financial Education will engage with the CAB in a discussion about the CFPB's Auto Lending Education Initiative. After that discussion, the CAB will adjourn at approximately 12 p.m. Central Daylight Time. At 2 p.m., the CAB's chair, Bill Bynum, will resume the meeting. He will introduce CAB members Chris Kukla and Seema Agnani for discussion on trends and themes in the field. Following the trends and themes discussion, Kelly Cochran, the Bureau's Assistant Director for the Office of Regulations, will engage the CAB in a panel discussion about the Bureau's Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPRM, to address consumer harms from practices related to payday loans, auto title loans, and certain installment loans. After the discussion, there will be an opportunity to hear from members of the public here today. As many of you know, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which created the CFPB, also provided for the establishment of the CFPB's Consumer Advisory Board. To advise and consult with the CFPB in the practice and exercise of its functions, and to provide information on emerging practices in the consumer financial products or services industry, including re regional trends, concerns, and other relevant information. Today's meeting and discussion is in support of this statutory responsibility. As a reminder, the views of the CAB members are their views and they are greatly appreciated, yet they do not represent the views of the CFPB. So let's get started with an introduction of our CAB members. The chair is Bill Bynum. Chair Bynum is the CEO of Hope Enterprise Corporation in Jackson, Mississippi. The vice chair is Mava Elise Brown. Vice Chair Brown is the executive director of Housing and Economic Rights in Oakland, California. Seema Agnani is the Director of Policy and Civic Engagement at the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development in Washington, D.C. Ann Bador is the Director of the Fair Financial Services Program at Texas Appleseed in Austin, Texas. John Baylor is a Senior Associate at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. Steve Carlson is the co-founder and CEO of Ascend Consumer Finance in San Francisco, California. Tim Chen is the CEO of Nerd Wallet in San Francisco, California. Kathleen Engel is research professor at Suffolk University Law School in Boston, Massachusetts. Judith Fox is a clinical professor of law at the University of Notre Dame in Notre Dame, Indiana. Patricia Garcia Duarte, is the president and CEO of Trellis in Phoenix, Arizona. Julie Guggen is the executive director for the Minnesota Homeownership Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Raul Hinojosa Ojeda is an associate professor at UCLA's Division of Social Sciences in Los Angeles, California. 
Christopher Kukla is the Senior Vice President at the Center for Responsible Lending in Durham, North Carolina. Joanne Needleman is partner at Clark Hills Consumer Financial Services Regulatory and Compliance Group in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Patrick O'Shaughnessy is the President and CEO of Advance America in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The Honorable Annette Rizzo is a retired judge now working with the Judicial Arbitration Mediation Services, or JAMS, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Phaedra Robinson is the Executive Director at the Coalition for Prosperous Mississippi in Richland, Mississippi. Ellen Seidman is a Senior Fellow at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. Jean Spencer is the Senior Vice President for Stakeholder Engagement, Policy and Research for the Homeownership Preservation Foundation in Washington, D.C. Jim Van Dyke is founder and CEO of Futurion.Digital in Pleasanton, California. And Joshua Zinner is CEO of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility in New York City, New York. We also have with us Delicia Hand, Staff Director for the CFPB's Consumer Advisory Board and Councils. I'm now pleased to introduce Richard Cordray. Prior to his current role as the CFPB's first director, he led the CFPB's enforcement office. Before that, he served on the front lines of consumer protection as Ohio's Attorney General. In this role, he recovered more than $2 billion for Ohio's retirees, investors, and business owners, and took major steps to help protect its consumers from fraudulent foreclosures and financial predators. Before serving as Attorney General, he also served as an Ohio State Representative, Ohio Treasurer, and Franklin County Treasurer. Director Cordray. Thank you, Zixta, and welcome to this meeting of our Consumer Advisory Board. It's a pleasure to be here in Little Rock today, and I look forward to our conversation. The feedback we receive from the members of this distinguished group invariably refines our thinking and our approach. It sheds new light on issues and helps us achieve better solutions for consumers. No doubt that will be true today. Next month, we will celebrate the fifth birthday of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. From the start, the Bureau has worked doggedly on behalf of consumers on many fronts. In these remarks, I will describe three distinct aspects of the most recent work that we're doing. One key task has been to create new informational tools and resources that empower consumers to become savvier shoppers. We call this initiative Know Before You Owe, and we've applied it to mortgages and credit cards and student loans. Today, we're unveiling yet another Know Before You Owe initiative, this time for auto loans, with a shopping sheet, step-by-step -step guide, and additional online resources. Another important goal has been to fashion new rules that protect consumers against the harms they may suffer from unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices. We've undertaken several years of research on the operations and effects of loans issued to consumers for quick cash. Based on what we've learned, we've just issued our proposed new rule on payday, auto title, and certain other high-cost installment loans. Finally, we look for ways to make it easier for everyone to implement our rules successfully and achieve compliance with the law. We recognize that doing so is good for consumers and for financial providers alike. One way we do that is through our e-regulations platform, on, an online tool we created that makes it easier to navigate, understand, and apply the regulations we're authorized to interpret, oversee, and enforce. So we will talk a bit about that as well. Let me start with our Know Before You Owe auto initiative. These new resources include an auto loan shopping sheet, a step-by-step -step guide, and additional online information. We've developed these tools and are releasing them today to help consumers take control of the auto loan process. We want consumers to use them to get a clearer picture of how much their loan will cost. The shopping sheet helps consumers break down costs and make direct comparisons between loans. 
All of the resources are designed to help empower consumers and aid them in taking control of the financing process to get the best result that is right for their budget. Auto loans are the third largest category of household debt for U.S. consumers behind only mortgages and student loans. In this country, we now have almost 100 million auto loans worth just over $1 trillion. For those consumers who do not purchase a home, an auto loan may be the largest debt they ever have. Nine out of 10 households have at least one car or truck, most of which are financed, 86% of new purchases and 55% of used purchases. The typical consumer takes out a 60-month loan, but the length, length of these loans and the amount of indebtedness have been increasing over time. On average, each vehicle is owned for about eight years, which means many consumers purchase several vehicles over a lifetime, and they may regularly repeat the budgeting and financing process. Sometimes consumers are still paying off vehicles they're no longer driving. The financing process can take the form either of direct lending, where consumers go to a bank, credit union, or other lender to get their loan directly before going off to buy the vehicle, or of indirect lending, where consumers arrange financing through an automobile dealership at the same time they buy the vehicle. Indirect financing is used for most transactions. Before developing the Know Before You Owe Auto Loan Shopping Sheet and other resources, the Bureau did some research. We looked at how consumers approach the auto finance decision and the challenges they face in navigating that process. The findings of that research can be found in a report we are issuing today entitled Consumer Voices on Automobile Financing. Perhaps not surprisingly, our research finds that even when consumers diligently research the auto purchase itself, using resources like Kelly's Blue Book and other internet resources that are much more common for consumers to use today, they often do not fully explore the available financing options. According to data from the National Financial Capability Survey, only half of consumers report comparison shopping for an auto loan. This is much like what we had found in the housing and mortgage markets where consumers spend a lot of time finding the right house, but often do not take the time to shop for the best mortgage. And that can be very costly. And the same is true here. The auto loan shopping sheet can help consumers shop more effectively. It breaks down the financing terms so they can make apples to apples comparisons from one loan to another. Anyone can download the shopping sheet from our website at consumerfinance.gov. We encourage people to print it out, take it with them, and use it when they're talking to lenders or to auto dealers who are arranging a loan for a consumer. Specifically, it helps consumers understand the total cost of the loan as well as the monthly payment. It's important for us to understand that when we lower the monthly payment by taking out a longer loan, we will end up paying more in total interest. A longer loan also puts consumers at risk of having the loan last longer than the vehicle itself. For too many consumers, focusing only on whether the monthly payments are affordable does not paint the entire picture. The total cost of the loan, the number of months of debt, the interest rate, and the additional charges also are important factors. The shopping sheet makes clear what consumers can negotiate and what they cannot. That's important information for consumers. Items that they can negotiate include the price of the vehicle, the down payment, the interest rate, the length of the loan, and the trade-in value of their current vehicle. Knowing what is negotiable allows consumers to negotiate with greater power and more clarity about the ultimate result. The shopping sheet also helps consumers watch out for add-ons and other costly financing features. Consumers should make their own assessment about the potential value of optional add-ons to their purchase or their loan, such as service contracts, extended warranties, specialty insurance, and credit insurance. They should also carefully check the paperwork to be sure all loan costs and other terms are the same in the end as what they agreed to during the negotiations. Our website also contains information, tips, and pitfalls to watch for, as well as a step-by-step -step guide to help consumers all along the way, from budgeting to signing the final documents. In short, we simply want to help people know before they owe. Consumers should feel like they are in the driver's seat, not just as they're buying a vehicle, but as they are financing it, too. While it's fresh in my mind, let me also talk about our field hearing last week in Kansas City, where we announced our proposed new rule aimed at and ending debt traps created by loans made to consumers for quick cash. Our rules would cover payday loans, auto title loans, and certain high-cost installment and open-end loans. After years of work, we determined that in such markets, where lenders can succeed by setting up borrowers to fail, something needs to change. 
Our extensive research into millions of such loans has brought to light several key facts. Our research found that most payday borrowers reborrow within a month, and more than half of all loans occur in sequences of 10 or more. With each new loan, the consumer pays more fees and interest on the same debt. The loan that was supposed to fill a short-term need becomes a long-term debt trap. It's much like getting into a taxi just to ride across town and finding yourself stuck in a cross-country journey that is ruinously expensive. We found similar rates of reborrowing for single payment auto title loans and found that one in five sequences ends with the consumer losing her vehicle. We also researched loans from several payday installment lenders and found that over one third of loan sequences end in default. We further found that nearly one third of auto title installment loan sequences also end in default and more than one in 10 end with the borrower's car or truck having been seized by the lender. Currently, about 16,000 payday loan stores operate in the 36 states where this type of lending takes place, joined by an expanding number of online outlets. Some of these lenders also make auto title loans or payday installment loans or both. What they have in common is that they offer quick cash on terms that make it very hard for consumers to pay off their loans on time. And they've devised ways to be profitable without determining whether consumers who take out these loans can actually afford them. In the case of payday and single payment auto title loans, this business model depends critically on repeat borrowing. For payday installment and auto title installment loans, the business model depends primarily on access to a borrower's account or auto title, which provides the lender with the necessary leverage to extract payments even when the borrower cannot afford them. As we took up the task of proposing reforms, we spent much time and effort learning about state and tribal regulatory regimes, including many discussions with state payday regulators, state attorneys general, and tribal leaders. Payday lenders already have to comply with federal law on matters such as truth in lending and debt collection practices. Now we're proposing to add new federal protections against lending practices that harm consumers by trapping them in debt they cannot afford. These strong, common-sense protections would apply mainstream lending principles to such loans. Traditional lenders, such as community banks, credit unions, and many finance companies, make an effort to determine a borrower's ability to repay before offering a loan with affordable payments. Both the lender and the borrower have a mutual stake in one another's success. But today, the borrower's ability to repay is often entirely absent from these transactions when it comes to payday and other similar loans. Our proposed rule seeks to address these concerns by protecting consumers from such debt traps. Let me first describe how the proposal applies to short-term loans. For these loans, the lender generally would need to apply a full payment test to determine that consumers have the ability to repay the loan without reborrowing. Specifically, lenders would need to verify the borrower's income, borrowing history, and certain key obligations to decide whether the consumer will have enough money to cover the basic living expenses and other obligations and still pay off the loan when due without needing to reborrow in the next 30 days. Lenders could also offer a loan with a principal payoff option, but only under specified conditions that are directly designed to ensure that consumers cannot get trapped in an extended cycle of debt. Under this option, lenders could extend a short-term loan of up to $500, but they could offer no more than two extensions to the original loan, and then only if the consumer repays at least a third of the principal with each extension. This proposal would afford somewhat more flexibility while expressly protecting borrowers from debt traps and providing them with a simpler way to pay off their debt. To further safeguard against extended indebtedness, lenders could not offer this option to any consumer who's been in debt over the preceding year on short-term loans lasting 90 days or more. The proposed rule takes the same basic approach to longer-term loans that it covers. Here again, it would generally require lenders to apply the same full payment test to determine whether borrowers can pay what they owe when it is due and still meet their basic living expenses and obligations. For payday and auto title installment loans, either with or without a balloon payment, this means consumers have to be able to afford to repay the full amount when it is due, including any fees or finance charges. Our proposed rule would permit lenders to offer certain longer term loans without applying the full payment test if their loans meet specific conditions designed to pose less risk to consumers and provide access to responsible credit. In particular, we're not intending to disrupt existing lending by community banks and credit unions that have found efficient and effective ways to make small dollar loans to consumers that do not lead to debt traps or high rates of failure. Indeed, we want to encourage other lenders to follow their model. 
Therefore, our proposal would not require lenders to apply the full payment test for loans that generally meet the parameters of the kind of payday alternative loans, known as PAL loans, authorized by the National Credit Union Administration. For these loans, interest rates are capped at 28%, and the application fee is no more than $20. The same is true of certain installment loans that we believe pose less risk to consumers. These loans would have to meet three main conditions. First, they must be for a term of no more than two years and be repaid in roughly equal payments. Second, the total cost cannot exceed an all-in percentage rate of 36% plus a reasonable origination fee. Third, the projected annual default rate on all of these loans must not exceed 5%. The lender would have to refund all of the origination fees paid by all borrowers in any year where the annual default rate of 5% is exceeded. Lenders would also be limited as to how many such loans they can make to a consumer each year. The Bureau is also proposing new requirements to address how lenders go about extracting payments from consumer accounts for these types of loans. Our research found that when these attempts failed because they were returned for insufficient funds, online payday and payday installment lenders often made repeated attempts to extract money electronically, even though they were unlikely to succeed in doing so. When these attempts repeatedly fail, consumers risk incurring substantial fees. So these lenders would have to give borrowers advance notice before accessing their account to collect a payment. In addition, we propose what we call the debit attempt cutoff. After two straight unsuccessful attempts, the lender could not make any further debits on the account without reaching out to the borrower to get a new and specific authorization. Based on our review of the available evidence, we believe that under our proposal, the vast majority of borrowers would still be able to get the credit they need in an emergency but now they would be shielded by an umbrella of stronger protections that would keep them from getting trapped in debt they cannot afford. We seek comment on this proposal from all stakeholders, and that will be true through the summer until September 14th. Finally, we want to share with everyone that we've recently added some further updates to our innovative e-regulations platform. As anyone who works with them knows, federal regulations can be difficult to navigate. Frequently, readers cannot follow them carefully without having to connect information from very different places, often separated by dozens or maybe even hundreds of pages of dense text. We found that many people were trying to understand our regulations by perusing paper editions or using several different online tools to piece together the relevant information. Even paid subscription services, which can be expensive, often do not succeed in making things very easy. So a few years ago, our people decided to try to create a new tool, which we call e-regulations. This tool organizes the information in a user-friendly format that lets people search through our regulations, refer to the definitions as terms are being used, and view the official interpretation alongside the regulatory text. It has drawn rave reviews from industry groups and consumer groups alike, which is no small feat. The only real complaints about this tool were that people wanted more of it. They wanted to see it cover more of our rules. So we're glad to announce that we've now added some important additional rules to our regulations tool on our website, which cover further aspects of the mortgage market and consumer lending more broadly. With these new additions, we now have on our e-regulations platform rules implementing most of the major consumer financial laws that we enforce, including the Truth in Lending Act, the Truth in Savings Act, the Electronic Funds Transfers Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, the Consumer Leasing Act, and the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. We continue to look for ways to improve and expand upon this tool, and we encourage you to suggest ideas that will make it even more useful in the future. I'm very proud of our team for developing the concept and now executing on it to help people work with federal regulations. I'm told that Maya Angelou spent some of her childhood here in Arkansas, and she once said, nothing will work unless you do. We take that advice to heart at the Consumer Bureau, and we've been applying ourselves to support and protect consumers over the past five years. Although some would like to put the financial crisis in the rearview mirror, we're keenly aware that much important work still lies ahead of us. And we will continue our earnest efforts to create a financial marketplace that works for American consumers, for responsible providers, and for the economy as a whole. We have much to discuss today, and I look forward to it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cordray, and thank you, Zixta. Uh, I'd like to join you in welcoming everyone to this meeting of the Consumer Finance Protecting Bureau's Consumer Advisory Board, um, both those who are here in the audience in Little Rock and those who are participating by phone. 
The first half of this meeting will focus on, as you've heard, on a new initiative that the Bureau is launching today. And during my course of service on this advisory board, I've been constantly impressed by the efforts that the Bureau has undertaken to focus on the consumer's experience while shopping. Specifically, are consumers doing appropriate cost comparisons? Are they familiarizing themselves with the terms of a financial service product, uh, service or product? And are they empowered in these transactions? Today, as you've heard, the Bureau has launched an auto lending initiative which is designed to help consumer, consumers navigate through the auto buying experience. As someone who I'm sure is not alone in having stress through the auto purchasing uh, process, I'm looking forward to learning more about this new endeavor. To walk us through this background research on which this tool is based, we have Irene Sariki, the Senior Financial Education Program Analyst. Irene will orient us to the research and consumer survey information which informs this shopping tool. Following Irene, we'll hear from Jean Ku, Assistant Director of Consumer Engagement. Gene and his team have led the development of this tool and they will describe and demonstrate it. After we hear from Gene and Irene, we will then turn to the cab for discussion. Irene? Second here. Uh, my Gene. name is Gene Koo and I lead the CFPB's Office of Consumer Engagement. And when Congress created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it authorized us to ensure that consumers have timely and understandable information to make responsible decisions about financial transactions. Buying and financing a vehicle can be amongst the biggest financial commitments a consumer makes. And today we unveil new resources that will help consumers know before you owe. These resources will help consumers navigate the process of financing a vehicle. They encourage consumers to, one, shop for an auto loan with as much care as they shop for the vehicle itself. Two, look beyond the monthly payment and use total cost to compare and negotiate for financing. And three, know before you owe by spotting situations and financing features that could lead to unexpected or higher costs later. We designed this initiative to respond to consumer challenges in the auto finance marketplace. And my colleague Irene Skriki will now describe those needs and the research we undertook to uncover them. Thank you very much, Gene. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, Gene, uh, and thanks to members of the CAB and the public for being here today for this, uh, um, for this discussion. So I'm going to set the stage um, for this morning's discussion by describing why auto finance is important to consumers and what we have learned in some qualitative research we did on this topic. Uh, and this is really reinforcing what uh, Director Cordray said in his opening remarks. Vehicle loans are the third largest category of household debt. It's about 100 million auto loans outstanding. Uh, about 90% of households own vehicles. Um, about two-thirds of vehicle purchases are financed. Um, and typically, uh, uh, consumers are buying and financing vehicles multiple times throughout their lifetime. Most cars are owned, uh, or autos are owned about eight years. Um, before replacement. So obtaining auto finance is something that people uh, may do over and over again, uh, and, and, um, and it's a significant and a substantial part of their financial lives. Um, and this significant uh, financial decision is also a complicated process and a complicated financial decision. Like other situations where uh, the purchase and finance um, happens uh, more or less together, it can be hard for consumers to separate the different um, decisions and features that they have to, uh, they have to make. Um, consumers face many choices in the auto finance process. For example, where to get financing, how much to finance, the duration of the loan, uh, whether to do a down payment and what size, whether to trade in a vehicle uh, or sell it themselves. Uh, they also face decisions around what are typically optional add-ons, by which we mean features or credit products uh, such as warranties or gap insurance that are added into the financing. Um, most, if not all, of these different features and factors are negotiable, and they all influence uh, what the total cost will be, how much they will borrow and the total amount the consumer will pay. Uh, and consumers may have difficulty keeping track of all of these uh, features, especially since some of these terms and features can actually change simultaneously during negotiations, and it is a lot to kind of uh, keep in one's head. Um, so we wanted to understand how consumers uh, experience navigating the auto finance process, so we undertook some qualitative research to uh, better understand this. Um, and generally, in our financial education work, um, 
to, in order to learn how to help consumers make well-informed financial decisions and achieve their own financial goals, we seek to understand what consumers know and how they think about financial decisions by listening to consumers talk about their experiences and also by examining, in some cases, the complaints that are submitted to the CFPB. Um, we use this type of information um, gathered by listening to consumers to inform our financial education efforts um, at the Bureau and also to share with others in the field of financial education to help improve their work as well. And so we use this process uh, in the auto finance area and the research I will describe today is being released um, uh, as part of the Consumer Voices on Automobile Financing paper that is uh, coming out today along with the other materials you'll hear about later. Um, so you can uh, read more about this in the paper. What we did in this research was two things. First, we um, did focus groups with just over 300 consumers in four cities in the summer of 2014. And we looked at consumer attitudes, perceptions, and actions around financial decision making, uh, including auto finance. Um, uh, in addition, we looked at some of the data in our consumer complaint database. Base. Um, the CFPB has been taking complaints for uh, basically the entire five years of its existence. Um, just over a year ago, the CFPB began to allow consumers the option to share their um, narratives, the kind of uh, stories behind their uh, complaints uh, in our public database so that others could see them. Um, since that started uh, a year ago, up to April, there were about 2,400 um, public narratives uh, on auto finance and auto issues. And so we looked through those, um, looking, uh, looking at ones dealing with obtaining auto finance, and looked for themes related to the consumer experience in obtaining um, auto finance. So I just want to note uh, generally that uh, these data sources gave us qualitative insights uh, into a broad range of consumer thinking. Um, but they're not necessarily representative of the U.S. population as a whole, and so we just uh, want to keep that in mind as we look at the data. It's meant to inform our uh, sort of financial education themes and efforts. So I will just walk through a few of the high-level themes from these two data sources that are in the paper. Um, so first, looking at the focus group themes in terms of the challenges in the auto finance process, um, we found that in general, consumers told us that they, they uh, shopped primarily for the vehicle, not for financing, as the director said earlier. Um, many people reported uh, researching vehicles, features, prices related to the vehicle, um, but generally didn't do the same for uh, the, the auto loan and the auto financing. Um, Consumers uh, told us often that they focused on the monthly payment uh, and not as so much on the other loan terms and features. Um, and lastly, uh, consumers reported that they um, rarely negotiated on financing terms. They may negotiate on the price of the vehicle, in some cases monthly payment or interest rates, um, but uh, not often on all the financing terms that are negotiable. And then the second set of themes in the paper, again, come from the uh, consumer complaint data that we looked at. And I'll just note that in the database, people are complaining about particular products and services. We really looked at that data through the lens of the consumer experience. So we were trying to understand where consumers were having trouble. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different take than what our consumer response team may do with that data. Um, and things that we heard included sort of, they sort of reinforced what we heard in the focus group findings. Uh, it looked like people um, often did not comparison shop, so consumers mentioned that they didn't always understand that they had financing options. Uh, they weren't confident about exploring those options in many cases, and um, in some cases they thought that there would be no difference between the different possible financing options available. Um, secondly, we also noticed in the uh, complaints the challenges consumers had in understanding and negotiating around loan terms. So consumers reported they found some of the terms confusing. Um, in some cases, they didn't know what the terms were they had agreed to until later when they began paying back the loan, and that there were fees that they didn't know about or found confusing. Then we also heard about some situations that consumers should be wary of uh, as they go into the, uh, the auto financing process. For example, some consumers um, uh, knew that the loan terms they getting, were getting weren't great, but they were told they could refinance in the future and get better terms. Uh, and when they tried to do that, it often didn't happen, uh, often because the size of the loan relative to the size of the car didn't make refinancing um, viable. And so they were, ended up with a loan that was more than they um, felt they could afford. Uh, in some cases, there were loans that generally, could, we could say, lasted beyond the life of the vehicle. 
um, in some cases, cars were damaged, stolen, or even returned to the dealer, but consumers were still left with balances owed. Uh, some consumers noted um, years into the um, uh, paying back the loan that they had made only a small dent in, in the principal and were surprised by that. Um, a um, fifth issue is um, problems related to the purchase and use of add-ons. Some consumers said they felt pressured to buy um, add-ons in order to qualify for financing. Um, other consumers found that add-ons that they had purchased ended up being difficult to use. For example, gap insurance that did not actually cover the balance of the loan when something happened to the car. And then the final situation we would just note is unauthorized loan applications or credit inquiries. Consumers told us that they had, um, in some cases, visited a car lot once and then discovered that loan applications had been filed in their name or multiple credit inquiries uh, had been made that they either hadn't expected or ha uh, had not authorized. And so these situations suggest that consumers need to be careful, need to have their eyes open, uh, need to examine paperwork, ask questions, uh, and walk away if needed in order to protect themselves in this, um, in this financing decision. So together, all of this data plus other publicly available data that we looked at um, suggested to us that many consumers face challenges in getting loans that are the best for them. And really this work has informed the um, educational resources that Jean is now going to walk us through. So Jean, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Irene. So to help consumers overcome those challenges that Irene has just described, we've designed an educational initiative with three main goals for you, the consumer. Again, to one, shop for an auto loan, two, look beyond the monthly payment and use total cost, and three, to know before you owe. And so our message is simple, understand the total cost of financing a vehicle. And with the emergence of longer repayment terms and other innovations, auto finance has become more complex, and you can't just compare total cost simply by looking at monthly payment. Our educational materials will help you figure out the total cost to better understand whether a particular loan makes sense for you. We've created a new set of web pages to help guide consumers through the process of shopping for auto finance. You can find that at cfpb.gov forward slash auto dash loans. And the centerpiece of our initiative is a downloadable printable shopping sheet. And we have copies available for those of you in the audience. Um, so you can look at that as we, as we move along here. Consumers can use our shopping sheet to figure out and compare total cost of different financing options and quickly see what is negotiable. And so let's take a look at how you might use this worksheet as a consumer. Let's start with the cost of the vehicle itself, including features, services, add-ons, and fees to get to the total cost of the vehicle. And then next, we'd figure out how much you need to borrow by subtracting your down payment and trade-in value to find the total amount you'll need to finance. And now that you know, how much, uh, now that you know what you need to finance, uh, you need to determine how much your loan may actually cost you. And so uh, we provide a space for you to record each of your loan offers. And remember, we're suggesting that, that you comparison shop uh, to include interest rate and the length of loan for each of the options. And you can use a loan calculator to, to determine your monthly payment, or you can ask the lender for that amount. And then figure out how much it's going to cost to borrow that amount over the life of the loan. You can add in your original down payment to the total payments to see the total cost of the, uh, of the vehicle, and subtract the cost of the vehicle from the cost of the financing, and that's how we would get to the total cost of the financing. And this lets you see the total cost of borrowing. The total cost gives you a powerful way to compare your financing options in addition to just looking at the difference in monthly payments. And again, you can download this worksheet from our website at cfpb.gov forward slash auto dash loans. While you're there, you can also read up on how to shop for an auto loan, how to, ex how to explore loan choices, what aspects of a loan are negotiable, and how to choose and lock in a good deal. For example, many people don't really know what aspects of a loan, an auto loan are negotiable. And we explain, that. we explain that while highlighting one of our main messages to consider total cost and not just the monthly payment. And while our online materials cover the most important topics, consumers who love to get down to fine details can also download and read our consumer guide to auto loans. And financial educators and others who work with consumers may also find this guide particularly valuable. 
We've also updated 61 auto finance questions in Ask CFPB, our, our popular collection of frequently asked questions. Uh, one example of a question that's in among those 61 is, if I co-sign on someone else's auto loan, what does this mean for me? Uh, my son happens to be turning six today, so I probably won't be looking at that question for another 10 years, but some of you might be thinking about that right now. Um, and so in conclusion, this educational initiative has three main goals for consumers, which I'll repeat again. One, to shop for an auto loan. Two, to consider the total cost of a loan and not just the monthly payment. And three, to know before you owe. And to help as many consumers as possible, we need to reach as many consumers as possible. And so I would remind everyone here that this content is public domain, and we hope to see others adopting it and adapting it so that we can help as many consumers as we can and to help them know before you owe. And again, this is the website where you can find these materials. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Irene. I'd like to open up the discussion now to the CAB and uh, invite you to talk about your observations about what's going on in the auto lending and financing marketplace in your communities and your thoughts about the research and the tools that have just been described. Chris, please. Well, thank you. And uh, first, I really want to commend you all on the work that you've done to put this tool together. The more time I've gotten to spend with it, the more impressed I am with it. And I know it's, it was a lot of work to get it to, to this point, especially something that's going to be helpful and understandable for consumers. So uh, great job on this. Um, I really appreciate that uh, the tool highlights the places that are negotiable. Um, and particularly in the financing market. As, as your research shows and as even the form shows, the, the auto finance market is much more complex than I think most people even understand. Even folks who study it regularly continue to find its complexity. Um, so giving folks an opportunity to see where they might be able to have leverage points is really, really helpful. I think also the, the connection that you're making between that, the, negoti the negotiability of certain parts of the loan and the need to shop around. And one of the things that our research has indicated is that it's not necessarily a question of negotiation ability, it's a question of leverage. So the folks who tended to do best tended to be those who had choices, who came in with multiple offers and were able to leverage those offers into a better rate. Our research also indicated that folks who just tended to try to negotiate um, didn't always fare so well. And in fact, um, our research showed that for borrowers of color in particular, that even those who said that they negotiated paid higher interest rates than white borrowers. And in fact, even folks who said borrowers of color who negotiated compared to white borrowers who did not negotiate still saw that they were paying higher interest rates. So I think that that connection is really important to make people aware that that leverage is going to be crucial. Um, and then also highlighting the fact that add-on, you know, how add-ons add to the total cost. I mean, certainly that's a, an, an old tried and true trick of, of expressing these costs as a factor of monthly payment. So, you know, wouldn't you, you know, for a dollar a day, you can protect your investment forever, right? And then you don't see how much that adds to the total cost of the vehicle. It doesn't show how much that impacts the amount of interest that you pay. So I think the, you know, you're hitting the nail on the head in terms of the places where folks tend to fall down the most and where it's easy to take advantage of them. I think continuing to draw those connections between shopping around is so vital. Um, and then particularly, you know, my last point is that um, in the subprime space in particular, I think that's where we tend to see that inability to leverage. So while for prime borrowers, there's lots of places that you can go, for subprime borrowers, many subprime lending outfits predominantly do their lending through dealerships. Um, finding a direct loan is more difficult, and so helping, especially those who are lower on the credit spectrum, and you talk about that in here, and that's really helpful, about making sure that you're, even if you're having trouble finding the loan, you should still continue to try to push forward and, and get, a, get another offer. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, I wanted to also congratulate the CFPB on another great valuable resource that I think, um, you know, one comment I wanted to make is that I think that this tool, you know, because it applies to so many more people than a mortgage would or another loan product, um, 
you know, really serve CFPB's mission to sort of change habits. Um, I think a lot more um, borrowers will also learn um, to, you know, they will learn um, how to really um, um, assess um, a loan in general and, and sort of learn more broadly what lending actually means and what the costs are. Um, so, so thank you for this tool. I think it's going to be really valuable and um, hope that it really um, reaches local communities. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about was uh, using VITA sites and libraries um, as a good place um, to disseminate these tools. You know, I think that people turn to VITA sites for uh, tax assistance. It's already um, a place where people turn to for financial education. So I think this would be a good uh, place to sort of disseminate the tool. Um, and then, of course, always have to think about translating in the long run. Um, and so I would encourage the CFPB to think about that as a next step. I also want to commend the CFPB for this tool. I think it's um, wonderful and very needed in communities. My question is, um, for the borrowers who typically are placed in a subprime loan, was there any research done to show that they have a better outcome uh, once they research and shop around for a loan? Um, I think that would be great to show um, the outcome of really putting forth the effort to go in well-researched and well-armed with um, options. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing to say, but we also need to show that, that there's actual a benefit, actually a benefit to it. Uh, my second question uh, concerns uh, leasing. Was there, was there any research around um, the difference between a automobile purchase and leasing a vehicle? Um, we know there are different uh, tactics used when a person is, is entering into a lease as opposed to a purchase. And, and if so, could you share any information uh, regarding that situation? I still haven't learned how to turn the mic on. Uh, we don't address either that we have very brief sections um, in the consumer guide on those. So there's a little bit of information, but we did not uh, look deeply into research on those two topics. But I think those would, uh, those would be great things for us to think about going forward. Um, so I also think this is a fabulous tool. I'm going to admit to never having financed an automobile because I couldn't figure out the financing. So, um, you know, even for people who think they know what they're doing, this is uh, a wonderful tool. And I know that you wanted to do it on paper in part to test and in part to um, enable people to have something with them. On the other hand, what paper does is it leaves you at the mercy of, as you say, a calculator or ask your dealer to figure out what the monthly payment is for various um, combinations of interest rate and term. And so I think if you're going to, uh, I think a, a good next step is when you put this on um, uh, an electronic device, uh, desktop or mobile, that you include, you embed the calculator in it, which I think probably is not very difficult, so that the um, the consumer really has all the control they need to understand what the monthly payment would be. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, um, uh, wanted to say a couple of things. I mean, I, I think what's really interesting about this whole exercise, the fact that there's really this attention to uh, data uh, to gathering information uh, from uh, the focus groups, from looking at, at these experiences, is is really just the the the, the quality. And I'm you know r relatively new to the cab, uh, and seeing the work of the CFPB, really the 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 immense amount of work and quality that goes into uh, uh, this before it comes out. The fact that the focus groups already were uh, almost uh, almost two years uh, ago. That's and I and I and I'm, I'm appreciating how much work goes into this, but I, I definitely uh, um, 
uh, want to, to echo this. This is a great first step. Uh, and, but, and I think it's something that people can put their heads around. Everybody's had this experience. I know, I mean, I go into, when I've, I've gone in and I've made, I had the same question about leasing versus buying. And you really uh, are, are at the mercy of the math uh, of, the, of, the, of the other side. So from a, 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 a negotiating point of view, if our objective here is to really sort of uh, even out the playing field and really give consumers protection, right, which is what we're talking about here, uh, it, I think it would be fantastic if we could take it to this next step of, of making that math more uh, um, uh, clear, right? Because in the end of the day, that's what you're really negotiating is you know the terms of this of the math the way and the way the math is being calculated, uh, you know it's it's just struck me you know any any time I know probably everybody in this room has been in one moment at this moment of this negotiation, and and it's it's really just an incredible uh, uh, asymmetric uh, um, uh, process of information right. So uh, classic. In fact, people have gotten a Nobel Prize talking about this exact problem of the asymmetric information in buying a car. So, uh, you know, how, uh, so this could be an incredibly important um, example, right? And I think a, 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 a way of really demonstrating uh, how everybody in this country would benefit by having these types of tools in these types of negotiations uh, and, and in the end creating a much fairer uh, marketplace, uh, coming up with much, uh, uh, much more interesting uh, uh, um, uh, uh, solutions. So I, you know, again, I'm very enthusiastic by this, but I, I would definitely recommend we we keep going here. We we keep going on this calculator idea, uh, uh, trying to make it. I know it's a challenge. Uh, I know you guys can do it, uh, and also definitely look into this this um, this lease as another element of these uh, of the calculation and you know, how that should be done. So, uh, yeah, great, it's on, we don't have an on-off switch. <laughs> so I started my career in auto, uh, in the auto industry, and uh, I bought a number of cars and feel like I'm a fairly savvy negotiator, but I had no idea that I could negotiate the delivery charges and a few other things. Those tend to just get kind of lumped in, so yeah, I think the point there is you can educate a lot of folks uh, through the, uh, the process that you're doing. I was. One thing that jumped out in the research was around gap insurance and um, some of the complaints that you're hearing on gap insurance. One of the biggest risks you have in a lease is if you actually you know, have a situation where you uh, owe a significant amount of money you know, during that process. And gap insurance is there to cover it, and if it's done right, it uh, can be a great tool. So the question is, um, I would have thought that that was a fairly heavily regulated, you know, it's an insurance product. So uh, I don't know what the regulations are behind that, but from a consumer protection uh, perspective, that seems to be an area um, that demands a little bit more inquiry. I don't know where that falls on the radar screen today. particularly enjoyed the more detailed step-by-step -step guide. I think it's very helpful because a lot of the time, a lot of the instances where people fall into pitfalls is when emotion overtakes the process and so it really breaks it down and helps people take the emotion out of the process. It addresses some of the practices of the high pressure cell or other kinds of things that happen. But one, one suggestion would be to have a page at the very front because it goes methodically through the whole process but if you don't read the whole guide you miss mm. out on some key information. Just what to do and common pitfalls. Just something that just pulls it out on the very first page because it will help people overcome the emotion. Because if I love this car, I'm going to want to do everything I can to buy it. And so if I have in my head, oh, wait a minute, they're talking to me in a particular way or I feel pressured, it will help people perhaps balance the emotion with the, the practical financial interest in a, in a more guided way. Thank you. Yeah, I want to follow up on those comments because there's a relationship with the earlier work that, uh, that you did, Irene, you're regarding how much investment the financial services industry uh, places into marketing and uh, compared with financial education resources. It's vastly superior. And uh, 
My dad was a car dealer, so I know very well that he was very effective <laughs> as a salesperson. And uh, so, you know, to your point, and you know, having the the borrower, you go in with armed with as much information about you know what they should consider, but also. Uh, an understanding of the sales techniques that they're going to be experiencing, I think, really helps them kind of push back and go, okay, so now I can expect this and, and, and so forth. Uh, I have observed um, in the rural community that my uh, house is in is that you know, now a lot of the auto dealers actually don't put prices on their cars. They do put monthly payments. So you go by this car, mm -hmm. it's 250 mm -hmm. a month or $300 a month or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be just a further way to obscure the actual pricing. So you have to really peel back that to say, okay, so what is this really costing me? Uh, rather than, hey, you know, for $250 a month, you can just drive off the lot today. And again, it appeals to people's uh, emotions and desire for immediate satisfaction. So um, other than encouraging borrowers, which I think this is a great tool, but to, to be aware of that and to try to resist that and to take a so approach, I think, is, is very important to their financial health. So. So Gene, Gene, to your point, the bureaus propose uh, total cost over the life of the loan as an apples to apples um, way to compare. Um, mm -hmm. benefit. Do you think that's an appropriate um, comparison point or? Yeah, I think the more people can, can, will take the time to do the comparison and to you know, take into consideration all the things that you point out, I mean, the better off they're likely to be, the better decision that they will be able to make, so. Josh. Yeah, again, I'd like to echo earlier comments to really com commend uh, the, the Bureau on, on, this, on this project. Uh, it's, it's another example of the Bureau being really creative in, um, in, in looking at a, a major problem and, uh, that, that people are facing across the country. Uh, and and really, auto financing is is a, you know is is really the the wild west, <laughs> and there are so many abuses, and so this is not just an important tool for uh, for for people in communities, uh, but also I think sets a template for restoring some set of some form of order to this marketplace, and and it's a really important first step. Um, I echo earlier comments that I think it would be really useful to have it sort of a. Um, a one pager maybe on what to look out for a cheat sheet for people I think that would be really really valuable it's uh, it, it's in this and and th and that's really important but it would be useful for people to not have to pull that out but to have that up front uh, I also think that the looking at total cost uh, over time is really really important uh, and echo those earlier comments uh, dealer markups um, are addressed in this um, that's that's one of the most serious problems that we've been seeing both anecdotally uh, and uh, the, 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 of course the data um, uh, shows that this is a problem nationally and that it has a really discriminatory impact uh, and, um, and, and, and that can really have devastating consequences for people who need uh, automobiles to survive to get to work. Uh, and so it's it's I, I like how it's discussed uh, in in this um, in this document uh, and how people are urged to negotiate uh, the interest rate when they get to a dealer. Uh, but but as uh, as we know, uh, high pressure sales tactics can be very very difficult to overcome. So I just want to say that this I think highlights uh, the 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 continued need for the outstanding work that the bureau is doing in enforcement in looking at auto lending discrimination and the effect of dealer markups in particular on people of color and communities of color. Uh, and so that that enforcement work is, is a very, very important piece of restoring this order, uh, order to the, or uh, I would say bringing order to the uh, auto market and making sure that it's fair for everybody across the board. Uh, Irene and Jean, I'm just related to that point. Um, in your research, were there observations that you gleaned regarding uh, differential um, in terms of geography or we all hear about the uh, stereotypical way that women are treated in these dynamics and certainly people of color uh, seem to be disproportionately targeted. What, are there observations that you glean in your research?
Okay, fail number three on the microphone. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we had a very diverse set of uh, consumers who were part of the focus groups. Um, we didn't do a lot of demographic, bre demographic breakdown in part because it was meant to be really qualitative. This is not meant to be a rigorous uh, qu uh, quantitative research study, but I think we can take back that uh, feedback and, and, um, and think about that for the future. I, I do think though, Bill, we've seen from the work we've done uh, on auto lending elsewhere, uh, we, we believe we, we know and we think we've heard from uh, industry on this as well, as well as consumer folks, that there is a certain amount of sizing up of the customer that happens almost immediately in this setting. And that uh, the people uh, they're working with, typically dealers, uh, will size up the customer and they know who the shoppers are. They think they can tell pretty quickly who the shoppers are. There's a lot of eyeballing that occurs and how they size up the customer can lead to a dramatically different ex shopping experience uh, and financing experience. So, so several things here that become key tips to consumers are number one, think about direct auto financing first, explore that option. Uh, you may end up with indirect financing, but you'll have a better sense of what your options are and you may well find that direct financing is a better uh, way, to, way to proceed. Uh, second, if you have these tools and resources and you take them with you, you may get sized up differently by those who are, <laughs> who are going to engage in the transaction with you and you may get a different experience. So it may be that this, this tool and the visibility of it becomes a factor itself in this, uh, in this dynamic and that's, that's something we're, we'll be interested in seeing over time. Thank you. Maybe. Thanks. Uh, a couple quick things. One is, it, especially if you add a calculator, sorry, that echo is kind of throwing me off. When you add a calculator, I, I add in something that makes the final total cost pop up on the screen, especially when you optimize for mobile, so that boom, I put in I put in the first one, I see what my total cost is. I put in the second one, Wow, great, side by side, total cost. And then I could see people really honestly taking, whipping out the phone and using this in their actual shopping process. This also seems, given the prevalence of automobile use, as if this is an incredible opportunity for the CFPB to maximize its, um, and highlight its utility, to maximize its resources by making this maybe a primary point of entry into the consumer's mind. You know, here's this incredible tool. Wow, I use this for an automobile. What else have you got? Okay, fantastic. This is my go-to resource for everything because it's automobile usage is so ubiquitous still. Uh, another thought was that we split the shopping and cost comparison from verification of final terms. And even, and I know you can't fit everything onto two pages, but, <laughs> you know, especially when you put it on, get it on somebody's phone, there could be that warning of, you know, read that final contract, folks. What you agreed to might not be what's in, what's in writing what's handed to you. Um, and then you've really got more of the total package, but I'd also love to see it in here because the deal, the warnings, it's really complete when you have that final piece. It's not enough to shop. You have to make sure you walk away with what you agreed to. Otherwise, this is fantastic. Thanks. Um, I've got Judy next. I don't know if that's on yet. Uh, well, again, I want to thank you for this work. I was actually in the audience at the um, hearing you did in Indianapolis on this issue, so it's nice to see the, you know, product come to fruition. Um, I just had sort of one question and, and one comment. Um, gap insurance is a huge problem that I see all the time, and where it's a problem is that, you know, a customer might actually want it, they might think it's a good idea, and they sign up for it, and then a year and a half later when they have a car accident and they go to collect on it, they have no idea who their insurance company is because unlike when you buy auto insurance and homeowner's insurance, you know, you have a dealer, you get a copy of something, most of the time, 
my clients either never got any information about who their insurance company was, or if they did, they have no idea. So when I was looking on your little link to gap insurance, it'd be, it'd be good to add in there, you know, if you actually buy it, get a copy of the policy, the name of the company, how you contact them. Because what I find with gap insurance is even if you buy it, you can't use it because you have no idea who it's with. Um, and then the other thing I would just like to add, I work a lot with financial counselors and I think this guide would be a wonderful thing for them to have. Um, you know, how do we get it? Is it something we, it gets downloaded from the web or can they order copies? You know, what would be the way that counselors could get copies of this, you know, for their clients? I'll answer that just quickly. I mean, it'll, it'll be both on the Take Control of Your Auto Loan site, but we also have a page for financial educators called Resources for Financial Educators that has um, all sorts of tools and resources that can be used. We'll put it there as well. And then we do outreach through our CFPB Financial Education Exchange, uh, which is sort of a, 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 a kind of a, something you can sign up for as an educator to get regular newsletters. And we'll do a webinar on this uh, and we will share it broadly. And it will also, I believe our plan is to make it orderable through our fulfillment site um, where you can either download or in some cases order paper copies. So all of the Bureau's sort of printable, or most of the Bureau's printable resources are available for order. Um, and so I think our plan is to put this into that process as well. So, and we'd love to have your help in getting the word out to educators about how they can use this. Thank you. Kathleen. Um, one thing, I, I want to repeat the, the thanks for this great work. I think one of the things that's really valuable in, in this device and to um, maybe to think about it going forward if you haven't already, which you probably have, is the fact that it requires action by the borrower. And I think that when people have to actively enter information, fill things out, they kind of become more committed to what they're doing. So I, I just, from a behavioral perspective, I think this is very clever. Um, the second thing is I'm a little bit worried about bait and switch. Um, I recently arranged to buy a car. I hadn't even seen it, but I knew what I wanted. I re renegotiated the price over the phone and went to pick it up. And when I got there, they said, oh, we made a mistake. We sold the car 45 minutes ago, but we have this other one. But it has a $2,000 sparkly paint job. Um, so we'll drop the price to 1500 You know how it goes, right? I got it for free. Um, but the important point is that People could go through this whole process, feel really comfortable, they've got the right car, the right financing, and then they show up maybe the next day after they've gone to a few dealerships, and all of a sudden the, the, um, the salesperson says, oh, um, well, I didn't get that approved with the manager. I have to go and get it approved now. So I'm wondering if there's, um, and, and just as, as a parallel, sometimes they will have you sign things during the negotiation, have the, the buyer. Um, they'll say, oh, well, would you be willing to accept this if I can get my manager to agree? And then they have you sign something. Well, what would happen if the salespeople had to initial at the bottom of each of the columns about what the price terms were um, and for the total cost? It wouldn't be legally binding. It's not a contract, but it would kind of shift the power in a way that might make it, um, may reduce the chances of a bait and switch. Chris? Thanks for the opportunity to do second round. Um, I wanted to respond a little bit to what Steve mentioned and then kind of build that into a larger point about add-on products. So, uh, Steve, you're talking about gap insurance and sort of the regulation around that. And uh, there has been this move in state legislatures to ch uh, change the way that it's regulated from being an insurance product to a financial product. So changing it from gap insurance to a gap waiver. Um, using North Carolina as an example, if it's gap insurance, then the Department of Insurance has oversight over that product and they can, uh, they can write rules, they can do all sorts of regulatory things related to that. If it's a gap waiver, then there is a sort of minimum terms in the statute that's required. The Attorney General can enforce that law but doesn't have rulemaking authority or any ability to go in afterward look to see whether there might be abuses. They might be able to do it under a, a UDAP claim, but again, it's kind of putting it on to an, an agency that already is overloaded with, with lots to do and not necessarily with strong experience in the insurance market. Um, 
And that's, it leads to a larger point about the complexity of add-ons. You're sort of, the consumer needs to know that that's the difference between a cap insurance product and a gap waiver product. Think about how many products are being offered in that finance and insurance office. I've sat down myself just off the top of my head to figure out how many of those there are, and I came up with about 30. Um, and so you can imagine what you're faced with at the end of a very long and grueling process that's designed to be long and grueling. Uh, so that you're more likely to buy these things. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but to the point of the educational materials, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about what the Bureau does is that you continue to look at these issues even after you've put these materials out and continue to look at ways to educate the public. Um, one specific point to this piece is that um, most consumers aren't aware that after they leave the dealership, even if they buy an extended warranty or an insurance product, most of those you can cancel and get a refund of the owner and premium. So if you have second thoughts about this thing that you purchased that you added to the loan, you can actually, you can get out of it. I think most consumers aren't aware of that. It might be worth pointing out to consumers that you don't have, just because you bought it and you don't like it, you don't have to keep it. Um, but to a larger point is this, it's very difficult to look at these add-on products and figure out what covers what this gap insurance example is a good one of, you would expect that the gap insurance would cover most events that would, re that would result in the loss of the car, but we know that that's not necessarily true. Some gap, gap insurance will cover theft, some won't. Um, being, it's very difficult as a consumer to be able to compare those different products. The disclosures aren't particularly helpful. It reminds me a little bit of the credit card market prior to the Card Act where they had stuffed so many different pieces, you know, disclosures within the disclosure that it was really tough for people to focus on the really important things that are in there. Um, and so potentially as down the road as you're looking at this, I, I would urge that looking at ways to help, help consumers to understand what the, what the important points of these add-on products are to be able for them to even just to ask the question of does this cover this, does this cover that, to reduce some of, you know, potentially reduce this and then be looking at the ways that the disclosures are being handled, whether or not there's a the role to play in looking at how that information is being given to consumers. Thank you. Judge just, let me just follow up with Chris for a moment. Uh, on the right to rescind, uh, I just don't happen to know, is there a time frame on that for the consumer? It depends and it's really up to the, to the provider. To, to, to have it, but it depends, and it also depends on what kind of product it is because some, st for insurance products in a lot of these cases, the insurance departments or state, state statutes require that there's a refundability and sets out the terms of that. It's different for each product, and so it just depends. So it's gonna vary with state law? It's gonna vary by state law and sometimes vary by provider as well. Got it, okay. Okay. Turn some microphones over here, I'm gonna steal real fast. That just sounds a lot like credit insurance to credit protection and what happened in credit cards, so. That's exactly what it is. Judge. Right. So all this great talk about it, tremendous product, but I found what I love is the fact that you went to data right within the website for comments and complaints from those who took up the banner to actually record it. And I see part of it is sort of what's the afterlife. There's so much involved, the depth of this, in terms of just getting the deal done on trying to understand it. But perchance is the next phase going to be on the other side of the um, ledger in terms of the D word, you know, when there's default in a sense, because this is so misunderstood and so precious. For those on the cab before, we saw that movie uh, Josh Silverman gave us about spent and the repossession of a car where a nurse really needed it to get to work. Right. So it's all in the fine print. Chris was mentioning it. That's, that's you know, constant through all of the products and issues we deal with. But on this side of the ledger, it's actually raised that even, you know, payment was still doing a loan when they didn't even have the car anymore. You can't give the legal advice. We get that. But sort of a roadmap of just to be Considered that could be, I don't know, possibly second phase. So you got the good deal, you want it sustainable, you did your, uh, your metrics, you went through all of the calculations, you read everything, but life changes, right? So unemployment can put exactly that consumer who felt very proud about a great deal still into a bad situation where um, thought might be some guidance from this group of, other than consulting an attorney, we get that, 
but maybe to be mindful of certain things that can right the ship, get you to a point where you can renegotiate or do something else that could really, just as a mortgage, find a path that really would keep that, uh, the auto with that consumer. So that's just a thought, um, and this is such a great base for it. Thank you. Great step-by-step -step tool. I see me using this a lot and promoting it. Um, if you haven't thought about it, um, I'd encourage you to consider a short video like using a YouTube just to introduce the step because I think that we will have more reach um, by a quick just one minute, two minute intro and lead people to the website to download the step-by-step -step guide and the shopping list. It's a great tool, thank you. Okay. Don. So I think a lot of the comments here have reflected that uh, buying a car is some form of psychological warfare. Um, and, and part of that is, I think, dealing with the onslaught of advertising that kind of comes, comes about. Um, by auto dealers, et cetera. One of the tactics I think that is still going on in the field is around tax time, January, February, when um, they're not selling a lot of cars and folks are getting their refunds, they'll market, you know, bring in your W-2. Um, this, I think, can have some effects in terms of people buying a bigger car than, or too much car than they actually are able to afford, et cetera. So, I, I'm not sure how to kind of incorporate that, but that is something that is, re, you know, really prevalent. I think around uh, tax time is when they, you know, market. You know, they're able to, you know, potentially estimate your refund and say, hey, you can use that for a down, a down payment or even do some type of refund anticipation loan to finance your vehicle. Yeah. May have to just chalk that one up to tough competition in the free market, but uh, I don't, I don't, we'll think about it. Um, yeah, uh, great, great tool. Um, I I just wanted to provide one observation that uh, we had uh, in our conversations with some credit unions, uh, which for certain credit unions that are heavily reliant on indirect lenders uh, may provide some sort of incentive uh, problem, um, both pertaining to gap insurance uh, as well as with rates. Uh, so I, I was um, chatting with a um, a fellow who was a salesperson into uh, car dealerships who works on behalf of the credit union. And I said, well, tell me about the things that the car dealerships really don't like and that you won't do as a result. And one of them was actually um, selling gap insurance at a highly discounted rate to people who are coming in to get pre-qualified for a loan. And the reason the auto dealer doesn't like that is because it takes away a very profitable add-on sale. Um, I, another thing he told me was that uh, he, they would uh, prefer to, uh, the, the volumes can be highly steered um, by the dealer uh, towards credit unions that they find favorable and one of the biggest factors for them, for the dealership is actually uh, whether the credit union pays on time and whether they cross market these profitable add-ons um, to the a customer in advance or after the sale. Uh, so um, just something to put out there. Raul? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm getting more and more excited as this goes on. Um, <laughs> I, I really do think that this could be a very interesting continued uh, project. I mean, uh, and um, particularly this, what May was saying, I want to continue. If, if, and brought up yesterday this, idea of uh, optimizing this for uh, things like this, right? Uh, uh, mobile and, and, and other features, because that's what happens, right? You go into buying the car, you're sitting there in that office, it can take quite a bit of time going back and forth. That's what you need, you need a real-time tool at that. And I don't know if you have done any of this work, I mean, there's a, something that I've looked at some, uh, called calculator.net, right? Which is a bunch of IT professionals that have, but the more you go into it, you, I'm not quite sure who's behind this. And, and uh, so I, it would be really awesome, I think. Uh, again, a rule, a, a, a type of a, uh, a contribution that, that this uh, uh, bureau could provide is to have a trusted source 
for this type of, ex, uh, of, uh, of tools. So, uh, you know, I'm a, um, uh, uh, as, as an advisor here, I, I, I would definitely uh, recommend um, doing a lot more uh, uh, resource uh, allocation towards this project, really uh, building this up, because it is, I think, one of the, 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 the touchstones that we can um, show to the public of why this really matters, right? This is a very big decision that people make, and they make it all the time, and it usually is a, a, a very emotional one, and you really don't, you're doing it in the dark, uh, and there's a lot of pressure and when that happens, you know, to have these various options and to, and to really optimize it, not only on mobile, but optimize it for the experience, optimize it for really balancing out uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that process and taking, taking the anxiety away and, and really making a, an important difference. On, uh, and there's a lot of other issues, obviously, that, that, and a lot of variables. I mean, I'm thinking back now, every time I've gone in there, there's, you, you do uh, end up negotiating, and the, and the stronger you, you, information you have, the better you're going to end up. There's no doubt about it. And this creates a much more efficient market in general because, you know, we, we end up, there's a lot of, 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 of fluff in this market. A lot of people get abused. We get, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, inefficient um, uh, uh, vendors. Uh, um, and so we're not, we're not helping any, anybody in the country by not, by not advancing even further in this, uh, in this way. The conversation around distribution and getting these materials out makes me think of another CFPB initiative and how you worked with a lot of credit card providers to post people's credit scores as part of their bill or part of their online statement. And I, I wonder, do you think there would be any receptiveness to certain financial service providers or like loan direct lenders or auto dealers in affirmatively providing this resource as a way to high, you know, highlight that their their option is going to be better than other things that you're going to you'll find I mean it would be very interesting to see if there was interest in the market in proactively offering this resource as a way of like saying that affirming that what they're offering might just be one of the better options and to help facilitate the competition and let the competition work in the marketplace we've I've heard several discussions about how to improve this tool, but um, also um, ways to, um, 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 give Kathleen's your idea about having the um, dealer sign off on, on the terms. Are there um, disclosures, um, other ways to improve disclosures or other tools that you all think would be helpful to um, protect and inform the consumer? One general question is, I think, across subject areas, I think about the fact that for the consumer wellness tool that the Bureau produced, there was a different version for seniors. And I wonder about whether there's some form of improvement uh, or design change across the board for disclosures in general based on the age of the viewer uh, and the fact that uh, apparently our ability to assess things starts to decline at like age 50 or something hideously young. But uh, so it was one thought and I also noticed for example on the CFPB and Espanol website it was organized slightly different, visually different same topics, wondered if that was a choice related to a perception about how a particular community may want to walk itself through a website. So similarly, like if different communities have different priorities, do you want to hit them with the thing that's most important to them first? If different demographics have different capacity, do you want to hit them visually with the thing that's most important first? A broader thought. So just very briefly, um, we definitely are interested in meeting people where they are, but that's just a s simple factual clarification. The, the reason why the, the Spanish website is different than the English one is just simply they were developed at different times, and so the content evolved in between. Uh, Irene and Jane, I, I, I wanted to make sure we um, 
were addressing uh, points that were most helpful to you. Are there other questions that you'd like to um, put before this group uh, feedback that you'd like? I definitely think uh, you all have raised important and interesting questions. Um, for, for us, the focus is actually a lot on what you have all underlined. What, is next, what are the next steps? It's really encouraging to hear um, from all of you about uh, what you think we should be doing next. We definitely will be exploring some of those options. Um, we would love to learn more about how we can help get this into the hands of consumers. I think that's the, the number one most important thing we've invested in this resource. But to help people, it's got to get into the hands of, of people who are intending to, to use it. So I, I'd love to just put that question out to any, everybody here. Pedro. Have you given any consideration to reaching out to colleges and universities? You have a lot of students who are first-time car buyers. They're away from their parents, don't really have um, a lot of people around them who are knowledgeable about things like this, and I think that would be a great resource for them. Uh, one of the things that I also wanted to point out was on the add-on ones, is maybe thinking about giving examples of what add-on ones are. I know in our area, in a lot of the, at a lot of the buy here, pay here car lots, um, those things are already pre-populated on the contract. So a lot of buyers feel like they don't have room to negotiate on those things because they're already included. So letting them know what an add-on is, I think would be very beneficial to consumers as well. Judy. Um, in response to ways to get this out, when I started um, teaching law, I think there were two consumer law clinics in the country, mine and Prentice Cox, who you all know. Um, now that's probably one of the fastest growing areas, uh, and we reach a lot of people across the country, and most of our clinical programs um, work very closely with community groups. So getting this out to consumer law clinics, and there are some that actually specialize in auto financing. Virginia is one that comes to mind. Um, but I think that that's a good outreach. Um, it's a nice tool for students, and then once students have things in their hand, they tend to pass it on to everyone they've ever met, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a good place to go. Julie. So, Jean, you know, there are literally thousands of financial educators working uh, around the country in a variety of venues, whether it's nonprofit organizations, legal aid clinics, uh, tax prep sites, uh, universities, extension services, I think they would all be natural avenues for you to distribute this information. I think um, given, given the mindset that many of these educators or coaches would have, one thing that I would add into, um, into, into the tool, I, I know that you really want to focus on what it, what it takes to get the right loan but I think the educators would be working with consumers to look at the whole cost. So uh, even, even just some very simple language about make sure you're thinking about the cost of auto insurance and the cost of maintenance when you're considering your purchase and your loan, because that factors into the general financial wellness of the consumer in this really important transaction. Um, so this may sound a little crude, but that's never stopped any of us before. Um, so one avenue I think that could be very valuable is philanthropy. Uh, philanthropy that actually funds nonprofits to actually interface directly with clients. That can be a way, I think, to kind of make sure this uh, tool is disseminated, not just this one, but other ones that the CFPB is, has developed that are consumer facing. Military, first paycheck, first payable to paychecks, kids just want to buy a car. You know, it's really unfortunate that uh, the Bureau doesn't have the ability to advertise as widely or as, um, as, as entertaining a fashion as some of these car dealerships do. I mean, you can't turn on a television or a radio without hearing this blasted at you. And it's, it certainly intended to appeal to people's uh, emotional desire to 
buy a car. And, and you know, if you know, Ellen's comment earlier about uh, being intimidated uh, and having gone through this process is, if, if Ellen's intimidated, you know, the, most people will be paralyzed. Um, by the experience of trying to buy a car. And, and also, it brings to mind for me the differences between being in an urban area where public transportation and transportation doesn't uh, put as much burden on you to own a car. But if you're in rural America, if you're uh, even in Little Rock, the public transportation is, is, is good, but it's, it's limited. And so if you don't have a vehicle, you're, 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 you're unemployed. And so it really puts a burden on people. And so um, getting information out into these communities in a way that is effective is, is critical. Um, not, not a day goes by when someone doesn't walk into one of our credit union branches with a story about being uh, either they, um, as Judge Rizzo mentioned, uh, they got into a situation and they've lost, um, they, 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 the car has been repossessed, or they, they, their, their payment is so large that they shouldn't have gotten that um, loan in the first place. And so we've been able to refinance those loans into, in many cases, into something that's more affordable, but not, not always. And so getting this information out into uh, communities that this uh, affects um, um, in, in, a, uh, in, in a way that they hear it is, is critical. I think grassroots groups, um, you know, certainly we as a credit union and many credit unions uh, appreciate the comments about uh, the, uh, the fact that there are products both in the payday space as well as the auto lending space that credit unions can offer that are more responsible and affordable. Um, but also nonprofits, as Don mentioned, I think are, are, are aligned with this in a way that um, if they were equipped with the information and if perhaps foundations or other resources made available to help them disseminate this information effectively, uh, they're going to reach many of the people in the communities where this uh, is, is the most devastating, where, where the abusive practices are most devastating. So uh, really reaching out to grassroots, to faith-based organizations, to the nonprofits, I think are are, are, are going to be very important as, as we make sure this, this, this really impressive tool is available to those who need it most. Any, any other points? If the, oh, Josh. Yeah, just one small thing on December. Uh, lo local, uh, local political, lo local elected officials, um, city council members, mm. assemblymen, they have big constituent services and I think would be very open to having these materials in their offices and they have a, a lot of them have storefront offices and, and see a large flow of people and are based in communities. So I think the more that this could get out to that network, I think it would be really helpful. There are no more comments from the cab. I wanted to uh, take us to lunch, but not before I really, um, again, echo the sentiments, I think, from this board and really thanking you, Irene and Jean, for the impressive work and, and to, the, to the Bureau for, um, I, again, I, I, I'm constantly impressed by the uh, efforts to make sure that consumers know before they owe. And, and that education is power. And so thank you for the, all the work that you do. And with that, we're going to adjourn for lunch. We'll return at 2 o'clock. At 2 o'clock. Thank you all for joining us.